You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. From Kenner's Star Wars collection comes the Stormtrooper, the Sand People, and all 20 action figures, including new Hammerhead, Snaggletooth, and more, each sold separately. And now, Boba Fett, Star Wars villain, with his laser rifle. Boba Fett is not yet available in stores, but you can get him free with four proofs of purchase from any Star Wars action figures. Details on specially marked packs at participating stores. Offer ends May 31st. Star Wars action figures sold separately from Kenner. everybody and welcome to Geek Fest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone and today we are going to visit our posters of the month. We are going to start off with Rogue One, a Star Wars story, and then Solo, a Star Wars story. We're kind of keeping it a little more current this time. Not only are we going to be examining the styles as usual and try to figure out, you know, who make these posters and that sort of thing, but really take a closer look at Solo because there is a, believe it or not, some sort of controversy. Uh, behind the scenes into the design of some of the initial posters for this film. Then we are going to move to our toy segment and go over Boba Fett. In particular, we're looking at five Boba Fett action figures, official releases that are slightly different than your normal releases, and some of the specialty, I don't know if I can categorize them as customized, but specialty purchase ones that kind of riff a little bit on that whole concept of other types of Boba Fett's uh, that have not been put out there yet. But we are definitely looking at some of my favorite releases over the many, many years, you know, officially from Hasbro into the Boba Fett motif. So let's get started with our posters of the month. Interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin direct via satellite from our on-the-spot task force. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Thank you, Bob. It's Mort. Mort, yes. I am Ted Baxter, and here is the news. Okay, for today's posters of the month, we are actually not going to go back in time as we've been doing for most of our editions of poster of the month. We're going very current. And by that, I'm talking about Solo, a Star Wars story, and Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Since the movie has just come out, I wanted to take a look at these posters, uh, specifically these two, because they're non-trilogy posters. They're the standalones. They're the ones that used to, at one point, be called the anthology stories. Now they're just a Star Wars story. That's the little tagline. And I wanted to see if there was a pattern here or anything that's different about them and how they compare not only to the older Star Wars posters, but just to posters in general. You know, how have we changed, you know, more or less with these posters? Well, let's begin with Rogue One, because it it happened first. With Rogue One, we got a completely new kind of poster, in my opinion. Gone are now the days of going to specific artists that are known artists. We saw this already in some of our past posters. The last ones we did, for example, Terminator, or even when we did Rambo First Blood Part Two. As early as the 80s, people were already kind of experimenting with photographs. They're moving away from the actual art you know, drawing, painting of these posters, and they were experimenting with just having a photograph, you know, slightly photoshopped here or there, you know, touched up, airbrush, you know, there was no Photoshop back then. But now we're in full Photoshop mode uh, when it comes to that sort of thing. The style has drastically changed, and not very frequently do you now see these full-blown posters that are made in the old style of just 
giving an artist a paintbrush and let him go at it. Now, for Rogue One, I haven't been able to find an, an actual name attached to the poster in terms of an artist, but I do have a poster design company called Bond, B-O-N-D, like James Bond. And they're out of Los Angeles, California, and they've been doing a ton of posters. If you go to their website, you're going to see a lot of stuff that you're very, very familiar with. And as far as Rogue One goes, it is somewhat of a departure from the style that we've been getting used to so far. Now, granted, if you look at your original Star Wars films, the original trilogy, and if you look at the prequel trilogies... You know, it all started with the originals, and the originals kind of set the standard for how these posters were going to look like. Because, obviously, Lucas was in charge, completely in charge of the prequels, he kind of remained in that style. He wanted to kind of continue that style. They did a little experimenting with the preview or the teaser posters and stuff like that with photos. But when it came time for the actual one sheet, the U.S. one sheet, you know, he stayed in that style and he used pretty well-known names you know to do them by the time we get to force awakens even though it's now a more modern time and even though now it's disney that is owning lucasfilm they kind of still continued in that tradition they kind of still had their actual poster look at least look like a traditional Star Wars poster. Now, let's keep in mind that that was done, I believe, on purpose because they did want to connect as much as humanly possible to the original trilogy. Not so much the prequel trilogies, but the original trilogy. And this is something that we keep, we kept hearing as the Disney you know takeover started, was that they were going to somehow downplay the prequels and hype up the originals the perception was still out there that there was a little bit of a kind of like a bad taste in people's mouths about the prequels and all the bitching and moaning about how they were not as good as the originals which you know i admit i am part of that crew <laughs> that didn't feel like they lived up to the potential they had excellent sequences in most of them but overall they didn't just kind of hold together that well so Disney, like I said, wanted to make that connection. They wanted to push the originals and push away the prequels. So it kind of makes sense to continue in that style. Therefore, the poster for Force Awakens, the final poster I'm talking about, the ones, the U.S. at least, version, it's a very reminiscent poster of the previous ones. It's, it looks a lot like the Return of the Jedi poster. It looks a lot like the prequel posters. It has that continuation kind of feel to it. And it kind of makes sense in a way, you know, chronologically, if it takes place after Return of the Jedi, you know, it kind of continues in that look. I get it. Fine. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just dumb luck. They actually used an artist. From what I remember, he wasn't a very well-known artist, but they did, you know, they, I, I did find a profile on him at some point and how they didn't go straight to like somebody like Struzan, even though they did use them later, you know, for some of the re-releases, I believe, or the IMAX or some of these other ones, but they did stick to that. Now, one of the things they introduced here was also the character posters, which seems to be now a, a staple of, of a big franchise type of marketing. And that is not only are you dealing with a standard poster, that you're going to have, but you're also dealing with international posters. You're dealing with all types of different banners that are made, images, specialty posters, like I mentioned before, for, for the IMAX release, for, for advertising Dolby, advertising a specific theater that's premiering, you know, all kinds of things, free giveaway posters. Well, now what they also have is the character posters that are part of the rollout of uh, these major, major films. And with... The Force Awakens, they had a series of character posters, you know, portraying the, the, the major characters. Now, the posters were a little more picture-oriented. They look, they look like photographs, but it's super grainy and touched up. So, I, I, again, I could be completely wrong, and these are actual paintings, but to me, they look just like photographs. Now, the poster for Rogue One, the, the U.S. poster, because, again, keep in mind, we have so many different ones that comes from this company called Bond, also did the complete roster of 
like a package of posters of, of designs of art for Rogue One. Not only do they have the, the poster, but just like in Force Awakens, you have your internationals, your IMAX, your Dolby, uh, your banners, your flags, you name it. And what's interesting is that overall, while the design looks kinda like something that is artsy in terms of, yes, it looks drawn. However, the, the to me, the pictures look a little bit that they might have came from a photograph, like they could have used a photograph's reference, which is nothing unusual. But it looks artsy enough to kind of get away with it, as far as I'm concerned. They do look drawn. And you have a cluster of the main characters in the center. You have the star of the film, you know, in the background. And you have Vader and the Death Star looming over everything. Underneath, you have the shore with the blue sea and coming kind of towards the water, because you do see the palm trees in the background. You have Imperial troops. You have, you know, AT-AT looking uh, transports. You have the uh, Star Destroyers and TIE Fighters and X-Wings and all kinds of ships and Stormtroopers kind of marching towards you. Now, what makes this poster very different, I think, from a traditional Star Wars poster is that the colors are different. They moved away from the warm colors that I was used to seeing in the original ones. With a, usually, you have a black background because it's the you know the, the space, space stars, that sort of thing, with colorful things coming at you from the center. Obviously, with all the pictures of the characters. Here, they went in a completely different motif because I guess they're highlighting the fact that. This is Scarif. This is a tropical island locale. And that is what they kind of selected to pick as the whole motif of color palettes. So you have a lot of blues, a lot of whites, a lot of grays, you know, for the clouds and that sort of thing. Everybody also has this kind of hazy whitish surrounding around them. In the top right corner, you do have a dark area because that's where Vader is. And it's kind of like the shadow part of the Death Star, and you see each Vader's outline there. Uh, so they were able to kind of put him in there and give you a little dark, but there are no real, like, oranges or yellows or reds that can, that, that pop. you got to also remember, this is a lightsaberless film. <laughs> so you're not going to get that also, which is something that you sometimes get on these other posters. What's also interesting about the poster is that they decided to give part of Jin Erso's face, uh, the shadowed part of her face, their shaded part, there's like a computer layout, like a diagram of a computer, and that's something that they used on all the character posters. They superimposed, I guess, like a computer layout, like uh, electronic grids on the face to kind of, I guess it's supposed to be the secret code, the secret map, the secret program that she's looking for, the Death Star plans, that sort of thing, to kind of remind you somehow of that, uh, especially, again, on the character posters, because everybody's faces were superimposed with that, but you do get a little bit of it here. Does it fit as a Star Wars poster? I think it fits. It works. It's an interesting design. But it is definitely, as far as I'm concerned, something that is saying to you, this is now different. And I assume the reason for it is because we're dealing with a non-trilogy film. So it does kind of keep its Star Wars motif, but it is definitely a different type of thing that you're looking at. Now, the other thing I would say is that in my opinion, I think these posters are also becoming more realistic looking. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I was saying that it almost looks like a picture, but it's really art, but it kind of looks like a picture. So I, I think they're trying to kind of ride the line. I wouldn't be surprised one bit if many of these images are basically photos that have been altered to look like a drawing, to look like art. Doesn't surprise me one bit. When I think of the previous ones original trilogy and prequel and all this stuff. to me that's more you know brush painted portraits this looks a little more modern to me which is not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing it's just different now originally the intent of a poster or at least in the manner of what things were done was a little different you know they did hire you know usually a couple of artists to do renditions of these posters and specifically i'm talking about as far as star wars went uh, you know, they, 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 they've gone through their list of your Hildebrands, your Jungs, your Macquaries. All these guys would kind of pitch their version of the poster, and then they would decide which one to go with. Everything was kept, 
You know, they didn't throw anything out because this way they would use whatever was unused for the U.S. release. They would adapt it to other foreign market or marketing art or promotion art, anything. It would just be reused in some shape or form. Granted, when you went to the foreign markets, the international releases, sometimes they actually went to local artists because they kind of understood their market, you know, better than an American, you know, would understand what sells best in another country. So that's when you get some t- some of these really bizarre posters that you look at them, you know, if you look at, and again, I'm dealing with Star Wars here, but I'm sure it's happened with many, many other films. You get these posters, you look at them, you're like, what the hell is going on in this poster? What, what, even, what movie are they even pitching here? And it happened with Star Wars. There are pictures of... Uh, I believe either Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi posters that were done near, behind, or in front (laughs) of the uh, Iron Curtain countries, of Soviet bloc countries, where you cannot understand what on earth you're seeing because it is such a very brutalist, almost cubist style that you're like, is that supposed to be Star Wars? Other than the fact that you actually see the word Star Wars somewhere, some of these drawings, you are just like, what happened here? Did a three-year-old grab a paintbrush and go at it? So it's it's very different. And that's how it used to be done in the past. They, they would kind of hit different places and, 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 you know, hire all these different people. You had a, you know, you did have some, some heavy hitters, you know, involved. And not all of them necessarily made it to the final round of the poster that was selected. You know, they, at, at the end, they would select the poster. But what's interesting is that the need was always there. So, in other words, the things that are needed now for marketing purposes were also needed back then. Except that back then it was done differently. Now it's done at least at this high level, you know, high profile method is done completely, it appears to be through these poster agencies, marketing agencies, design agencies, whatever you want to call them. What happens now is you have a one-stop shopping place where they take care of everything. They do everything for you. They do all the posters. They do everything for you. You don't have to worry about it. And I guess in, in a way, they probably, I imagine they might save some money by having it all done in-house in one place. Um, they, they, you have more control over it. You have more things can be done faster and cheaper in that manner. I don't know. Maybe. But, you know, every now and then you do luck out and get some top-notch artists to uh, do the main poster. But I haven't seen that run very recently. Now, another thing about these Rogue One posters, and not necessarily the one that I'm talking about right now, the final U.S. one sheet I'm talking about, but the preview posters for Rogue One, and even some of the banners that were done by this company, they showed scenes that never made it to the film. So, in other words, the preview poster has a shot of the whole crew running in the beach. They're running through the water and the sand towards an area, and they're being engaged by stormtroopers in the water which we've seen behind the scenes footage. We've seen even this Bond company did a couple of banners with all the stormtroopers walking on like, you know, ankle deep or knee deep blue crystal water. And I remember how they were highlighting that during the promotion of the film of what these beautiful shots they got. Well, those are shots that practically never made it to the film because as we all know, there were reshoots, the ending was changed and this whole sequence of everybody in some shape or form, making it further out into the story and not being killed off one by one like you would do on this sort of a film, had them all running (laughs) through the beach, all the characters in the water, you know, that kind of thing. Well, it's interesting that the promotional poster uh, had that because up until that point, they were still kind of aiming at that, I guess. They were still thinking that's how the film was going to end. So... If you have that preview poster, it's it's a very uh, unusual poster to have. The fact that it's the poster itself is showing you deleted scenes. Another poster that I'm not sure if this particular company did, but I did see as a preview poster. Again, it's possible that they went out of this house for preview for other posters too, but they might also be part of this company because the, the style is looks looks very very much like what I'm seeing in their in their website. And their website might not necessarily show you everything; they might only show you part of it. But there was a Russian poster also that showed a helmet kind of upside down in the water, the rebel symbol on it, and it had you know Rogue One everything in in, in Russian. 
very very creepy looking one because it's obviously a, a soldier that either died or that lost his helmet or something uh, and that was a really cool looking poster too so again this is one that because it's official it's official you know you can't ignore this it is a different style and it's there and i think it starts to kind of tell a story about what to expect with future posters having to do with these offshoot movies they do want them to look different now this brings us to solo i'm not really going to talk about the movie because this is not the proper place for the movie but i'm talking just about the poster here this is a poster that has a, an interesting history behind it the one that i got is the one that i ordered through Disney Rewards. As a matter of fact, the Rogue One I got, I got all of my most recent Star Wars posters, my Disney <laughs> Star Wars posters, they all come from Disney Rewards. And that's something that if you have enough points that you get through either going to the movies or buying uh, certain DVDs, Blu-rays, whatever, you can upload those those purchases, those points, and then you get points, and then you can exchange those points for merchandise. I specifically hold off so I can get their posters. I don't get all of them because they, they, they do put out quite a number. They usually put out a preview poster, uh, sometimes multiple previews. Then they put out a regular. Sometimes they might put out a character poster, a miniature poster. I try to stick to at least just the main U.S. one-sheet poster. If they happen to put out a secondary one, eh, I might get it or not, depends. But for Solo, what I've gotten so far at least is the main poster, which is... Let's see, we have Solo in the foreground, and he has the Solo stance holding his blaster forward, aiming slightly off to the left, let's say. And then walking forward around him, you have all the main characters, where uh, uh, Lando, Kira, Chewie, Woody Harrelson's character, and a couple of the other gang members that are part of the gang there, and including the robot in the back and the lady over there, um... Overall, behind them, you have like the silhouette of the cockpit of the Falcon, and the Falcon is in the background too, behind everyone. You don't see it that clearly, but it is there. Then beyond the cockpit, it's some planet that has to do with the movie, obviously. You have some ships flying around. They're not very recognizable ships. They're new, I guess. Uh, there's some weird-looking bison or buffalo-looking creatures uh, standing up top on top of a hill and all these weird-looking buildings, too, on top. So that's the overall feel of what you have. And now the colors are completely different than anything you've ever seen before for a Star Wars film. Just like I mentioned before how Rogue One has a very blue and white and grayish kind of motif, this one is completely different. This one is all white and orange and yellow those are the primary colors of this poster there are no blues there are practically no real blacks no real green there's no greens all the cool colors are gone from this this poster is the opposite of rogue one as far as what they're trying to portray even the design of the silhouette of the cockpit is something that's different that we haven't seen before either in these sort of posters. It's a more artsy design, silhouette type of design, not just gathering characters in the middle and putting other drawings or pictures around them. They're kind of hiding them. The floor, like below the knees down for everyone, is just plain white. So they, they removed whatever ground they're supposed to be there because I guess this way they can kind of photoshop everybody in that position i'm pretty sure these are not posed pictures that people all pose for in one shot this looks like something that was manufactured in pieces granted once again like i said before for rogue one things do kind of look like that there are drawings they do look like art but they also kind of feel like maybe there are pictures that were then enhanced to look like drawings it's a very interesting design and I'm not entirely sure which company did this one. However, this is where things get a little weird with this poster. This poster was released, I believe, sometime in February of this year. Uh, right around the same time, I think, where they released uh, one of the trailers for the film. And it was the first introduction of the one-sheet poster. And along with this, they also introduced character posters, like they've done in every other film so far. You know, Disney's been involved. The character posters that they've introduced for this 
particular film originally were basically four of them, I believe. And it, it's it's kind of like a sheet of paper that's kind of slightly wrinkled and rippled a little bit with the cutout of the name of the character in the middle. And through the cutout, you could see the character you know, behind the cutout. So you have Solo in big letters. And in the background, you could see Han Solo, similar to this poster a little bit, with this orange background, and then you would have Lando with uh, kind of like a bluish background, and Chewie with a yellowish background, and I think Cora had like a purple background. So it was a series of these four posters with this particular design of the, the cutout, like the stencil cutout name with their picture as if it's behind the stencil. And they're really interesting, good-looking posters. They're very different. I've never seen them before. And it was like, wow, that's pretty neat. And then a little later... All of a sudden, I started to notice this postings on the internet about those posters. And there was an individual, um, I think he's from France, who did some graphic work for some albums, from some music albums, for Sony Music in France. And he posted pictures of his CD covers or album covers of four different you know, I think it was like one was jazz, rock, or whatever. I don't even remember. There were compilation CDs of some specific genres. And the way that he did them was exactly, exactly that way. Not only did he use that kind of postery, that papery with the stencil cutout, but the pictures underneath, the colors, were matches practically identical to what they had put out for this film. So something happened behind the scenes where... Disney started to investigate what happened, and a couple of weeks later, they changed those posters. They pulled them, because I guess they decided, and the guy was probably right, that somebody had, had either stolen the design, or maybe, it is unknown right now still, maybe they did purchase the rights to use them, but they were so familiar that they kind of cost too much of a ruckus you know they might have purchased the designs from sony for all we know the rights to use them but the guy was never told i guess the guy in theory could have lost the rights the second he gets paid initially and then whoever you resell those rights to you know you're out of luck because they could resell them 10 to 15 times who knows i don't know it all depends on the contracts the contracts are very tricky the bottom line is that they decided to pull them so what happened after that is they redesigned the character posters. Now, the character posters now look different. They look different. Gone is the whole stencil design, uh, you know, that looks as if you're looking through something. They basically took the art from behind the stencil and brought it forward. So it's just the character. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky, too, because if you go to this Bond website, they are now the ones who have Solo as one of their clients and you do see some of their art you don't see this older art but you see newer art that is kind of based on this initial design so i can't tell you for sure if they're the same company that started this did they get in trouble for it i don't know had they gone to a different company first and now they went back to bond again i don't know it's still kind of murky as to what exactly happened with that whole thing another thing that a lot of people are also noticing is that specifically you know through bond the international posters that they're coming up with, they are exactly pretty much like the original versions that they had, especially the character posters, but they seem to have removed the guns from all the characters. Some of these earlier character posters had the characters, each of them holding a gun, you know, a blaster, whatever Chewie's holding his weird looking right, you know, it's Star Wars-y stuff. But then, boom, all of a sudden they removed all the guns. Now, one theory going around, again, not proven until we hear you know, from actually somebody in charge, is that because of the, one of the latest school shootings here, they might not want to, at least on print, you know, overstate or promote you know, the, the gun play and that sort of thing, especially in an international market. Is that true? I don't know. Did they change it because of the style? I don't know. Did they change it maybe because it was too reminiscent of the stencil one? Possible. So in other words, just removing the stencil might have not been enough. The art behind it was a little too reminiscent. So by changing kind of the stance of the character, eh, playing with the colors a little bit, they still have what they, you know, what they had in the first place. So that is a possibility. What's interesting, yes, is the fact that this whole stencil thing 
that we now have, that one sheet U.S. poster is still there for the main poster as far as the cockpit of the Falcon goes. So it kind of has a, a remnant of that initial idea that was probably stolen or cribbed, or maybe it was a concept that was copied and then never bothered changing to something more original because they wanted to go with it. Who the heck knows? But it's still kind of there. Now, with this poster, you don't really see the main bad guy that's being advertised, which is Paul Bentley. He does show up on these other posters. He does show up on the international posters and some of these other posters, especially the UK poster. And that seems to be the one that is mainly credited to this company called Bond. Character posters, eventually they made more, not only the, the first four characters, but now they went into all the other secondary and tertiary characters, even the robots and some creatures and stuff like that. So they've made, they've expanded on that whole motif of character posters. But completely gone is that original possibly copied design that got somebody in trouble. I'm sure they did, and I can't wait to really read about it because it's really interesting that you never hear this kind of weird buzz, you know, having to do with cribbing posters. You know, this film already had lots of problems to begin with. And again, another theory is that, you know, because they, they, they you know, they, they lost their directors, they were fired almost uh, three quarters through the film. There were rumors that the lead actor had to get special coaching on how to act <laughs> don't know if that's true and now you have this whole poster controversy of somebody stealing the design so I, I guess this was like an easy way to kind of like you know what let's let's fix this right away we're so close to premiering that you know we don't want more controversy surrounding this film but is it different yes it's different you have the name of all the characters on top that's another thing i forgot to mention that usually you haven't seen. Not even in Rogue One do they bother putting the names on top. Here you have all the top characters, including Paul Bettany. Even though they don't have his drawing here, they do have his name at least on it. Uh, unless he's hidden somewhere in the background, and I can't tell if he's like a little, you know, where's Waldo type of thing. But like I said, this is completely different. This is completely different than Rogue One. It is the opposite of Rogue One. It's more artsy than Rogue One. If you look at the international poster, it is more traditional. The one that Bond has on their website, it is more, to me, it even looks more like the original trilogy kind of posters. Is that, that style? It looks a little more, the color, it's not, it's less artsy. It's more colorful. It gives everybody their proper colors to their outfits. Here, everybody's shaded orangish. So you don't know what color things are. But, with the international ones, which I don't have, I don't have the international poster, you, you do get a different flavor for it. But, you know, again, I, I like to at least stick to the American releases. I like to think that the poster they, they're selling me as the U.S. poster is the one that you will see when you walk into the theater. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, just as we're about to put this piece to bed, I found out some more information now about the poster. Quick little thing I wanted to mention is that the directors that were initially fired from the film, they have an executive producer credit. Uh, this is something that was announced a while back as some kind of an agreement they came to because obviously you can't have co-directing credits. There's all types of rules about that sort of thing when it comes to somebody who was fired, in this particular case, a pair of gentlemen that were fired and then Ron Howard took over. So whatever the agreement that they came upon, whether it involves money or not, I'm not sure. I'm sure they got paid. But as far as credits go, they are listed as executive producers along with a few other people. So that is uh, rather interesting. Now, to the issue of the possible plagiarizing of those posters that I was talking about earlier, I found the company that actually created the original campaign, the original posters. The company is called BLT communications and they are an ad agency based out of hollywood california if you look at their website it's a who's who of films and the posters they've done you probably recognize just about every single one of them very modern stuff you know all of the latest films you can think of they're in there these people are publicity poster advertising machines it's incredible the amount of work that they're doing if you call up their solo a Star Wars story section, you have their samples of all of their work. And in it, you do have the solo poster that I'm talking about right now, the one sheet. And then you have a couple of foreign posters, 
But what's very interesting is that you have all four of those posters in question that I was talking to you about before. Except they've completely removed the silhouetted stencil look so that all you get is what's behind the silhouette and the stencil. Which is what I was talking about earlier too, that they're there. They're still putting them as their, you know, they're claiming them as their because I, I guess they figured, but by just removing the stencil, it's enough of a fix, I guess, to still be able to show off their work. Now, don't get me wrong. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous. The color scheme is beautiful, but it is pretty obvious that this thing was lifted uh, from somebody else's work, at least the color schemes. What they also have here, and you can compare them, it's amazing, is another set of posters, uh, which are the ones that I was telling you earlier that are a little more expanded in terms of other characters that are practically exactly the same as those other ones except they've removed any hint of guns or the arm that's holding that gun so for example Han Solo they basically substituted his arm that is normally holding the gun with a arm that's kind of pointing down same thing with Lando they removed the gun hand and replaced it with a regular arm same thing with Chewie and same thing with Kira. They did it, and they're there for everyone to see. So this is getting interesting. This is an interesting story. So we're, at least we were able to find the originators of this campaign. Now, the question then becomes, who is responsible? You know, which specific artist is taking responsibility for this? And right, and right now, through the website, you can't tell. The funny thing is that the website has a section that says who we are. And you click on it, and it shows you pictures of dozens of artists all black and white photos with no names just kind of pictures and i wonder if whoever was responsible for this campaign that got in trouble is still working there it would be really interesting to know the other thing i wanted to mention is that this particular set of posters that they quickly tried to hide and get rid of because of this potential legal problem let's say you can still get them at DisneyMovieRewards.com, the same place where I got that original poster that I received, you can order those individual ones with the stencil on them, you know, in exchange for points, like I've gotten these before. And then another example of something also kind of weird is recently when I visited Disney, this is now after the movie has come out, apparently for the Galactic Knights event that they had, a, a few a few weeks ago, coinciding with the, you know, I think the premiere of the film, they gave out free buttons to uh, a lot of the people there. And a lot of the cast members also were wearing these free buttons. And the free buttons are basically the solo poster, the one that I just mentioned. It's a variation on the stencil, uh, because, it, the, you know, the, the font of the word solo stencil is exactly the same as the, this controversial one but the picture behind it instead of it just being solo it's a combination of you know four or five characters but it is kind of shaded uh, orangish but it does like i said it, it's still that same exact format you know and now i can't tell if were these things already on order and the, you know they had already made them ahead of time before this whole thing exploded <laughs> with this poster same thing with the, you know the disney posters were they already in stock and they couldn't just take them back and replace them with something else is it not as much of a big deal that requires correcting to the point where they have to completely get rid of these things or not you know i don't know but it seemed kind of odd i remember walking through the park Hollywood Studios the other day and I'm seeing all the cast members with these buttons and I'm like where can you get those I asked them and they were like oh no these were not uh, for sale these were giving away for free the day of the uh, you know Galactic Nights and you know I'm looking at them and then when I get home I'm comparing you know I'm like that's what I saw and that's what it looks like it looks almost exactly like the same thing like I said the only difference is that they changed the picture in the background a little bit by adding more characters but you know Solo is still there holding his blaster like he originally was before they revamped it and even removed the arm for other markets so you know as soon as I saw it my you know I went oh my god I'm going to have to make another update <laughs> to my segment about the poster so this is really interesting I've never heard so much drama surrounding a poster a movie poster specifically a Star Wars poster out of all things 
you know, sometimes you hear about photoshopping and how people are made look thinner or bulkier or stronger or whatever, more beautiful airbrushing people. That's usually what you hear about. But this is really, really interesting. I've never, like I said, I've never heard of something like this happening before. So I just figured I'd let you guys know on, about this little extra information that I found out, you know, just at the last minute. You can collect them all. You are a toy! Batteries not included. Just get those wonderful toys. Details on specially marked packages at participating stores. Is that the Six Million Dollar Man's boss? It's Oscar Goldman. Why do you have that? That's worth a lot of money. That's much more valuable than Steve Austin. Action figures each sold separately. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Some assembly required. All your favorite Star Wars heroes and villains. I have three of each, one to display, one to open, and one just in case. On this segment, originally I was thinking of calling it A Tale of Five Bobas, but then I was also thinking about calling it Boba Medium Rare. The reason for is that I'm going to talk about five different Boba Fett action figures. And these are figures that are not insanely exclusive. In other words, these are what I would consider to be affordable Boba Fett, you know, reasonably affordable, not necessarily easy to get today. You know, you might pay a few bucks for them. Uh, they're nowhere near the crazy, uh, you know, rocket firing status, uh, you know, authenticity and price or rarity. But the first one I'm going to talk about is one that was offered a while back. Uh, you had to order it. And what they basically did was they reproduced the Boba Fett with the rocket firing feature. Now, the rocket firing feature is very different than what it used to be originally. Obviously, nobody eventually got that <laughs> rocket firing feature, you know, on the first initial wave. But many, many, many years later, you know, as part of the vintage collection, you were able to order it. And what they did is they took the figure... They gave it some sort of a rocket firing mechanism so that it actually looks the way it's supposed to look. And they carded it. So it wasn't even as if you were getting it in a little box like initially you, you got your Boba Fett or you were supposed to get your, your rocket firing Boba Fett. And what's cool about this package is that they completely replicated it, at least the front of it, not the back, but the front, exactly, exactly like they originally had. It is unpunched, which is something that's very important to collectors. I really doesn't really matter one way or the other to me. It's with the Star Wars card on it, which is really, really cool. Because most of us, by the time we actually saw Boba Fett carded, you know, it was more like a, like an Empire card, possibly, or Return of the Jedi card, which is, you know, two different things altogether. And this gives you an, a nice little reminder of what that rocket-firing Boba Fett one would have been like, you know, if you ever had it brand new. But as we all know, you know, there's a big story behind that and why they weren't able to make that one. So this one is really, really cool. I know other people that have been able to create these customized, uh, they're not mass market and they're definitely not Lucasfilm or Kenner or Hasbro sanctioned ones. They're, they're done in somebody's basement probably or something where they, they do take a, a mold. They, they create it. They know they don't necessarily paint them. They, I think they used to sell them. I don't know if they still do, but either a dark blue or like a, almost like a, like a grayish kind of color one. I ended up buying one once just to have as a reference of what this whole rocket firing thing was all about. Because, you know, at the time there was no way you were going to get your hands on one. The other thing to keep in mind is that the original concept one, if you will, the one that they showed you on the little sticker in the, in the front or the back of the cards and in some of the publications also, you know, coming soon type of deal, you know, send your proofs of purchase. The coloring is completely different. And what's really interesting is that somebody I I recently I've noticed they've been making I don't know how they do it but they've been making those concept looking ones with those slightly different molding looking parts and the different colors you know the the yellows and the reds things that make it look more like a concept figure than whatever the you know the final you know bluish purplish kind of uh, shade that we ever got with him now, I bring up specifically that prototype one, the one that, as I said, you know, was featured in the picture and the little insert and the little sticker in the carrying case insert. Also, some of them, you had this picture 
because it was manufactured. It was some sort of a prototype that has the old prototype colors, more in the yellows, like I said, and the greens and the, and the reds, and even the helmet looks a little different. That specifically I want to focus on a little bit because recently I received one as a gift from a friend of mine, which you can probably still find these. They're manufactured, I believe, in Singapore out of all places. And they're basically homemade. They cast all these different parts to assemble the unit together. If you go on eBay, for example, and you find this particular manufacturer, uh, you can probably look it up under Kitbash Boba Fett. Uh, that might get you there, or at least you could see what they used to look like. There's a lot of pieces that make this thing up, and then they have to be hand-painted and then assembled. It has multiple rocket-firing devices that you can attach to the back. It has the traditional, you know, slotted type, very much similar to the one that Boba Fett has on the Kenner figure, that cylindrical kind of rockety looking one. But then they also comes with a more accurate, slightly triangular rocket, the one that you can probably see better at some of the costumes, especially the prototype costume that we'll talk about a little later. So it comes with all these you know, extra features that are really, really cool. It comes with a blaster. Obviously, all this is reproduced, but it is also completely, you know, with five points of articulation, which is fantastic because a lot of times, you know, these things are cast solid, you know, so that's when they're really, really homemade. But here they went to the extent to make it so user-friendly, playable. It comes also with a little antenna, which is something that obviously the other figures couldn't have you know, until you got to the more modern ones. But the antenna, you have to attach it. And it it just happens that for me, I had to actually cut the antenna a little bit so that when you do insert it into the head, it doesn't stick out too much. The way it, they had it was they would stick it. It was just sticking out way too much. So I had to kind of modify it slightly. It is just a, an amazing figure. And, and one of the things I kept thinking was, why, about time somebody makes something like this. But, you know, these... I think they're still out there. You can still get them. I remember mine. I think I had to. I, I'm pretty sure they they were order. They were mailing mail order ones. Uh, that was the only way to get them. You could definitely not get them at the store. And it was part of. It might have been part of an anniversary type of uh, publicity that they were doing. My second Boba Fett that I want to talk about is one that's part of the 30th anniversary Star Wars collection. This is also part of the. Let's see. I guess you could call it part of the vintage collection. Uh, it's got a little sticker that says, uh, Star Wars Ultimate Galactic Hunt 2007. And this is the animated debut Boba Fett. This is part of that wave, if you remember the Macquarie waves that came with those medallions, those coins. This is one that also comes with a coin. And the body of this one, as opposed to the one I was just talking about before, the one I was talking about before, it is exactly, exactly the Kenner body. The Kenner mold. This one now uses a more modern body, but it is painted entirely in the holiday special <laughs> motif of, uh, you know, animated colors. In the back, you also have a picture of the animated, I guess, still shot of Boba Fett holding this weird looking trident. It's a trident without the middle pokey thing. <laughs> I don't know what you, is it a dudent instead of a trident? I don't know. But this is a, yeah, this was a really interesting uh, design. And I know a lot of these, like, for example, this one I know, like Sideshow or Gentle Giant. A lot of these fancy, fancy uh, sculpting companies, they made versions of this, sculpts, you know, busts, all kinds of. But for me, this is perfect because this shows me a Boba Fett that was in its kind of proto stage. They kind of got the design right. The colors were off, you know, compared to the final product. But they matched it pretty well. Now, granted that the, um, you know, I imagine for, for economy purposes, they really didn't mess too much with his sculpt. Like I said before, they're using, I believe, a pretty standard Boba Fett sculpt. It's just that they colored it different and they gave him different accessories. So it matches more or less what the animated short that was part of the holiday special had. You know, his colors are completely different. So uh, it, it's really an interesting way of doing it. I wish they would have. And I, I'm pretty sure I might have seen already because everything is out there. People have done just about everything. Um, this kind of coloring uh, as a custom with a vintage Kenner figure. Uh, now, granted, you can't card that. But 
I wouldn't be surprised if somebody tries recarding those, uh, but just being able to paint them because that's the thing you got to keep in mind. Just like I mentioned before that the, uh, you know, there are some concept Boba Fett's uh, out there that have been repainted with the original figures. This kind of stuff gets done all the time. You could do that. You could take this figure and grab an original Boba Fett kind of figure and repaint them. The people have done some fantastic job, but I wish they would have done an official one. You know, take an official Kenner action figure mold, have them repaint it, give it the extra accessory, give him that pike, that that stick, give him that extra gun that he seems to have that it's not a traditional Boba Fett gun, but at least it gives it a little more authenticity in terms of it being, you know, more vintage authentic. Uh, so that's something I, I, I'm surprised they never, uh, you know, they never gave it a shot doing that. Now, the next one is another uh, mail order one. And this is also around that same time as some of these other ones I was just talking about. But this one is called the Boba Fett Prototype Armor figure. This is carded, exclusively carded to the Empire Strikes Back. Unpunched. Ooh, unpunched. <laughs> The style is exactly the Empire Strikes Back style. It even has the Kenner logo in the front. What makes this uh, unique is the fact that they are basically taking the prototype armor Boba Fett, the one that we've seen so many pictures of, which is completely white. It was a completely white armor design that they used. And I'm not sure if they were going to use them as completely white or they were just going with white at first as just because they were still building it and they hadn't decided on the color scheme. But there are pictures and there's actual video of footage of, I think it's Ben Burt. I think it's Ben Burt. Kind of like interviewing the character, you know, the, the guy wearing the costume and showing all the features of what he does. And there's tons of pictures of this, uh, you know, uh, in the internet. And so what they did here is they took, again, a traditional Boba Fett, a Hasbro Boba Fett, and repainted him so that you know, I'm I'm looking at right now the the animated debut Boba and the prototype armor Boba. They look exactly the same in terms of the molds. The molds look identical. But what they did is they completely redid the color so that he's primarily white. His pants are kind of like a very light gray, and there is a difference in shading. Now, I'm not entirely sure if the difference in shading is due to there actually being a difference in color between the armor and the cloth underneath, or if it's maybe just a little lighting trick, you know, things look a little darker underneath than the stuff that's further out. So I'm not entirely sure, you know, why there's such a difference in the color. Maybe the reference photos they were using uh, are different. Who knows? Now, once again, I'm going to say the same thing I said before. Uh, this is awesome. I absolutely love it. I also, but I also wish they would have made a, a three and three quarter Kenner style body painted this way, you know, so you could buy either one or both. That would have been a nice alternate option. But no, they went with the standard one. And, you know, he's got accessories, he's got some guns and he's got some stuff. But this was a great little, this is definitely a collector item because most kids, they don't even, I mean, not only do they not care, they've never seen these pictures before. They've never seen these behind the scenes pictures. In the back, you could see there is a picture they use uh, of, a, of, of a completely white Boba Fett and somebody's working behind them, I guess, on the costume or stuff like that. So that's pretty neat. Now, the fourth item, the fourth Boba Fett that I'm going to talk about is very similar to this one, this prototype one, because it's the prototype uh, Boba Fett, but it is the black series version which is the six inch version this is another one that was hard to find this one i remember it, i think it was a walgreen special and you either had to find it at walgreen or you had to order it by mail so all of these uh except for the animated boba fett were all through the mail as far as i'm concerned and this one took a while because i remember the orders were being rejected and people were getting angry and uh somehow i don't know how i did it but i finally managed to get one now in the six inch version as you guys probably know things look incredible i mean you look at this thing and obviously with the six inch version you're dealing with realistic looking stuff there's no such thing as a kenner look because they're you know they're not mimicking kenner figures they're doing them from scratch for the first time sculpting molding everything so this is a completely realistic looking boba fett which i don't own any personally of the other boba fetts they put out but i'm pretty sure what they did was they took their standard boba fett and colored it completely white that makes perfect sense it looks great there is 
almost no difference. There's a very slight difference between the armor and the cloth. Less, way less than the smaller action figure that I talked about previously. You do see a slight change in color, but overall, you know, if you're looking at it from like, you know, four feet away or something, it almost looks like it's completely one color, which I think it's supposed to be. I don't think it's supposed to have that shade, that variation in the grays and the, and the whites. I think it's supposed to be a little closer to itself. It comes with the proper rifle, the proper gun, uh, which are traditional Boba Fett. Nothing special, nothing old looking. You know, it is modern, modern, modern all the way. This particular box, this is the Black Series, like I mentioned before. It's, uh, it's completely black, but it has the, um, instead of the traditional orange, Cloud City looking uh, light stripe. This one is all blue. So I'm not entirely sure if this is, if blue was a color that they used for an entire wave of them or for just uh, this special one that they put out. I'm not entirely sure. I like this, uh, you know, I like the black line. Uh, I'm not a fan of the packaging. I, I enjoy the, the molding of the figure and the look of the figure. The pricing is you know, through the roof. It's It's at least two or three times the price of what an action figure should cost. Uh, what are you going to do? That's the price uh, of business these days. The other thing I don't like about the black line is the fact that the, the packaging skimps on the art. You don't get the nice art that I enjoy from a traditional card back. With a card back, you have just in the front alone. I mean, forget about the back. The back, usually you have all the other figures you could buy. But in the front, I'm a big fan of the of the art, the, the original Kenner art, which is a still photo from the set or from the movie. You know, that's that's the traditional one. But even through the years, there have been some pretty, pretty nice card art. Uh, sometimes they're not too nice. Sometimes they're amazing. Well, the Macquarie ones, obviously, I absolutely love those because they... Yeah, they give you this full-blown picture of of a Macquarie drawing, so you can't go wrong with that. But even, I would say, Clone Wars had very good card backs. The Force Awakens, marvelous, marvelous looking art. Rogue One has good art. Last Jedi, I honestly don't own (laughs) enough to tell you. I think they're pretty good looking art. But there were some older uh, versions uh, I know that the vintage line, they try to recreate that, you know, that snapshot picture ones. Every now and then they put those on. Recently, they just put out a few figures in that style, too, which is kind of nice. It's a throwback kind of style, you know, if you're into that. Uh, but there were some more generic waves that they put out in the past. Uh, Revenge of the Sith and the Clone Wars. Uh, and even Phantom Menace, I think, might have had a couple of clunky looking ones. So it's not always, uh, you know, guaranteed that you're going to get a nice... Uh, um, you know, art on this stuff. I mean, there are some black series, that, obviously the small black series, the, 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 the more than five point of articulation figures that they're still putting out in those little black boxes. They're horrible. I absolutely hate those. They're super expensive, uh, just for the extra articulation and no art. To me, part of the action figure is the art. I love the art on the action figure. But finally, the fifth Boba Fett that I like to talk about is what is considered to be the concept Boba Fett, not the prototype that we just talked about before, but the concept one that was also part of the 30th anniversary line. This is part of the same wave that we got the animated Boba Fett one that I talked about earlier. This was part of the Ralph McQuarrie signature series line. And just like they put out, you know, all the McQuarrie figures, this was one of them. And it is a Boba Fett McQuarrie version And when you first kind of look at it, when you compare it to the prototype one that I talked about before, you can kind of say, oh, it's the same thing. But when you really, really take a closer look, it is noticeably different. The armor is different. The cloth costume underneath, the jumpsuit is different. Everything is pretty much different. They didn't just recolor it. They actually re-sculpted, you know, a version of them. Now, what's cool with this Macquarie one is that it comes with two heads. You could swap out heads because Macquarie had done similar, had done a variation on the helmets, a different kind of variations. The final one that we are kind of used to seeing, which is the T-shape visor. But then there was one that was kind of like a, you know, slightly separated eyes, uh, less of a division in the middle down the nose and a bigger mouthpiece. This is also a concept helmet that was used i believe in clone wars a couple of episodes where obi-wan is impersonating a bounty hunter and he's using his helmet they kind of went back and grabbed you know this concept this is also around the time where joe johnston was also fiddling around with the concepts but as far as this figure goes they give it complete credit to the macquarie drawings 
This also has, as part of its accessories, not only does he have a gun that appears to be very, very similar to the gun that the prototype one has, which might be also the same gun that the regular action figure has, but this also has a burst of flame that you can attach to the wrist, to one of these wrist uh, gauntlets that he wears, has a little hole, and you can attach it, so if you wanted to, you can pose him, you know, with shooting fire uh, from his uh, left gauntlet. Uh, again, this is, like I said before, part of the um, 30th anniversary Ralph McQuarrie uh, signature series. It comes with a coin. This is one of these coined ones. But anyway, this was just about Boba Fett's. These are five different Boba Fett's that are... I would say they are collectible, you know, if you're into collecting, uh, if you have, if there's a meaning to your collection, I mean, if you just want to get every single Boba Fett that's out there, that's one thing, that's your type of focus collecting, I get that. Uh, but for me, it's more specific, uh, you know, more different looking variations that I'm more into. And uh, we'll see. In the future, we, we might see some more, you never know. Now, I know that close to Boba Fett, or at least the style of Boba Fett, I've purchased, I believe from Clone Wars, some of the Mandalorian soldier looking guys because of the armor. Again, I, I, I enjoy that uh, that style. But, you know, this is a character that I would not be surprised if it gets revisited in some new and exciting way that we haven't seen yet. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's addition to our posters of the month. We concentrated fully on Star Wars, very current Star Wars, not even the old-timey Star Wars, but the more current Star Wars this time. You know, a lot of interesting things researching this one, specifically the Solo one. You know, all this weird behind-the-scenes, you know, who drew it first, who stole from whom, and the different marketing agencies that are involved it's really amazing you know how it works these days as opposed to the old days when we can you know profile a specific artist now it's an entire company that you kind of take a snapshot look at you know because trying to figure out exactly who drew it is a little little too complicated not like the old days and then i hope you guys also enjoyed our boba fett segment you know i have in my collection so many different figures uh, granted i'm not a completist but i do you know, pick up some of my favorites, and these particular five, alongside the individual ones, not the carded ones that I mentioned, those those uh, kit bash ones and prototype, you know, that kind of stuff, they're really an interesting bunch of, uh, of Boba Fett figures, you know, it's an easy thing to kind of collect, they're not that hard to find, and they're not that crazy, insane, and expensive, and you do see, like, how sometimes, not always, but sometimes, they really put in a real good amount of effort into making these available uh, and presentable you know for people's collections and hopefully they'll continue even with some of these other ones that I mentioned that are just right now you know sold as individuals through private collectors and people that are customizers maybe these will slowly little by little become you know maybe on a San Diego Comic Con exclusives or a celebration exclusive or something mail away exclusive that'd be great if they do that so, I hope you guys enjoyed today's show, and we will see you next time here at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. If I'd known since I was four that I was going to be shooting a Star Wars film, I would have planned it all my life. This film, this character, this story I grew up with. It's a whole world I've been thinking about for quite a long time. You can feel everyone in the crew and the cast kind of stops and just takes that in and you remember, oh, we're actually in Star Wars. It's like the world's greatest toy set. It's a bit like being that kid again. <laughs> the Star Wars figures. Stormtroopers over here and then this happens, there's an explosion. It's been a lot of fun. It's the greatest job in the world. Rogue One takes place very close to episode four. The simplest way to explain it is that text you see at the beginning of A New Hope. That is essentially our movie. They call it the Death Star. Terrible weapon. But there's a way to defeat it. Jin's starting to put together a team. She wants to fight. We all do. How many do we need? It is an ensemble movie, but at the heart of it is a strong woman. The time to fight is now! Every day they grow stronger. All these characters are real heroes that are willing to risk everything. Light the place up and make ten men feel like a hundred. 
through their journey, we see the formation of the Rebel Alliance and the stealing of the Death Star plans. Anyone not willing to risk being left behind? Now's your chance to speak up. That is a bad idea. Hey, quiet. They achieve what they achieve because they achieve it together. This is Rogue One. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com, or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2018. This broadcast is part of the IC Robots radio network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long.